We know we're going to have some folks driving in, so we'll the weather that uh, slows some folks down and we're uncertain as to the magnitude of the impact of the storm in our area. But we're glad that we're here. Amen? Glad that you're here. Amen? Amen. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get everybody up on their feet if you are willing and able. Okay? Come on. We're going to begin our time with full proportion. Come on in.
Thank you, Lord. We do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Last few years that I've been down there, 
Uh, it's been very touching, very subtle moment. It's also an opportunity to shake hands with and thank uh, some of the first responders who are down there in person. So uh, it's really a great, great opportunity for us. Um, Wednesday night, we have our midweek prayer service. If you are available and you can call in, you can call our, our conference call number and you can be part of our prayer service, I highly encourage you to do that. It's not just enlightening and, and really a blessing to you. It's a blessing to others when you call in and you pray for the church and you pray for others and you pray for them. An incredible thing happens. You may be familiar with the verse that where two or more gathered in my name, there I am also. Amen? Amen? It literally means that when we invoke the name of Jesus, He comes into our presence and begins to fill that atmosphere with His very peace, power, and presence. Amen? Amen. That's awesome. So if you haven't done that, 973 974 973 but I'll get you the number. 86753. Yeah, whatever she said. Don't dial that number. That's number. I know, I know what you're saying. Don't dial that number. <laughs> but I love you guys, and I'm so glad to see you here this morning. But did I miss any other announcements? All right, stand with me and continue our time of worship.
seen how the Psalms give us a beautiful way to see the truths of God's word come to life before us as the psalmist reminds us of God's presence, God's power, God's purpose, God's plan, and God's peace. And he brings into the lives of those who turn from their sin and humble themselves to call upon him and turn to him for their all. The Psalms also provide us with a starkly transparent view of man's situation before God. How apart from God, there is no peace, no joy, no hope, and no real sense of purpose or meaning that ultimately leads to destruction. The psalmist reveals that such is the plight of an unrepentant person before God. My life as a believer and now in ministry affords me with many opportunities to share my faith and the word of God with others. Some of these people have been receptive. Others not so. I've come to believe that while the world is filled with many different people groups, with many different languages and cultures, traditions and belief systems, there's really only one race of people, the human race, and in that race, there are only two kinds of people, lost, saved. And this, as a result of God's amazing grace being extended to those he knows will respond to his saving grace through faith in Christ. Without God's gift of saving grace, no one can come to a saving faith in Christ whereby they receive God's free gift of forgiveness of sin and salvation from the wrath of God. I like the way that John Piper said it best, so eloquently. The wisdom of God devised a way for the love of God to deliver sinners from the wrath of God while not compromising the righteousness of God. God literally is saving you and me from himself, by himself, to himself, and through himself. If you get that saving. Amen. Amen. As Baptists, we believe in God's irresistible grace. Simply put, the doctrine of irresistible grace refers to the biblical truth that whatever God decrees to happen will inevitably come to pass, even in the salvation of individuals. The Holy Spirit will work in the lives of the elect so that they will inevitably come to faith in Christ. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit never fails to bring to salvation those sinners whom He personally calls to Christ. God's word will never return void. Amen? Amen. At the heart of 
this doctrine is the answer to the question, why does one person believe the gospel and another does not? Is it because one is smarter, has better reasoning capabilities, or possess some other characteristic that allows him or her to realize the importance of the gospel message? Or is it because God does something unique in the lives of those in whom he saves? If it's because of what the person who believes does or is, then in a sense, he or she is responsible for their salvation and has a reason to boast. However, if the difference is solely that God does something unique in the hearts and lives of those who believe in him and are saved, then there is no ground for boasting and salvation is truly a gift of grace. Of course, the biblical answer to these questions is that the Holy Spirit does do something unique in the hearts of those who are saved. The Bible tells us that God saves people according to His mercy through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, those who believe the gospel and are saved do so because they've been transformed by the Holy Spirit. Our role in it as believers, as individuals, and corporately together as the church is to go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to tell others what he has done in us and to us and through us. Amen? Amen. We are called to go and tell. So often, we don't want to sit and wait. Watch and see if they'll show up, come through the door. If they'll, they'll ask us, you know, an all-important question about faith and somehow we'll stumble into a, well, uh, I believe in the Bible and I believe in Jesus and I go to church. Those are great. That's not what they asked you. But they ask you in so many words is, is why do you believe? What's he done for you? How has it transformed your life? Give me a reason to believe. While we are in agreement with what God's word teaches regarding God's Holy Spirit being the agent of salvation, we also believe that each person is ultimately responsible for how they respond to the truths of God's word. You see, the truth of the matter is that we all have choices to make each day. To try or not to try. To believe or not to believe. To walk by faith or walk by sight. To trust and obey. To be free or distrusting. Free in Christ or distrusting. To live for God or to live for ourselves. To choose life by the Spirit or choose life by the flesh, which leads to death. God's Word often addresses the choices people must make, and the Psalms often provides us with such examples. Today, as we continue our summer in the Psalms sermon series, we'll examine Psalm 1. See how it involves two kinds of people, two kinds of paths. And two kinds of destinies. I find that people in this passage have to make a choice. Like these two people, these two paths, and these two destinies, we too must make a choice. Not just once. Not just on Sundays. Stand with me this morning in honor of being God. Psalm 1. Read it with me. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. 
Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Let's pray. Lord, six quick verses sets the pace for the life you want us to live. I pray, I pray, dear Father, that wherever any of us are right now in our walk, whether it's a brief time or a long time, that you would, Lord, open our eyes to see the truth, our ears that we might hear your spirits pleading and crying, our minds that we might grasp the significance of these truths in our hearts, Lord, that we would be receptive to them, that we would then take them and begin to lift them out. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. See. Two kinds of people. Verse 1 begins. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. This passage tells us about two kinds of people, the blessed and the wicked. The blessed, perhaps we first need to understand what it means to be blessed. The word means happy, a heightened state of, of joy. The best interpretation of the word blessed in this context, however, is implying very favorable circumstances, often resulting from the kind acts of God. God's word in other places says of such a person. For example, in Psalm 84, 4, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Psalm 94, 12, Blessed is the one you discipline, Lord, the one you teach from your law. Psalm 119, 2, Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. There are many, many more such references throughout God's word. Blessings that belong to those that honor God, His word, and take hold of His promises. When we set ourselves to, to live out the promises of God's word, to take on the statutes and obey the word of God, we're living a life we were meant to live. Listen to me now. When we are free in Christ, we are finally free to live, to choose to obey Him. Prior to that, we had no free will. We were in bondage to sin and death and hell. We didn't have the choice to follow Him, to do His will, to walk in His way. Many would argue today and have for many years followed a false doctrine of free will thinking, well, anybody can do whatever they want to do, whatever they want to do it. You're going to choose. No, the decision was made way, way back. You have inherited the sin nature from Adam and Eve. And you have exacerbated your already dire circumstances by your own bent towards sinful, selfish, self-seeking, self-serving nature. I love my grandkids. I think they are the most precious two little people on the planet. And the third one that we have in the round, I'm confident is going to be equally just as dynamic. Amen. I'll pay you more later. <laughs> now listen to me. I love them dearly. But I also know that my precious little granddaughter, as smart as she is, has already, already learned the difference between right and wrong. Here, let me give you an example. We're down there visiting one day, and her mom and dad say, okay, you need to go and take a nap upstairs. So she says, okay, and she kind of hems and haws, and she fusses a little bit. She comes down two or three times for 15 different things. I need some water. My stuffed animal is on the right side of the bed. You know, all that kind of stuff. And finally, okay, now you need to go on. You need to stop.
stay up there. Close your door. It wasn't, it wasn't five minutes. <laughs> my, little, my little one was peeking out the door to see if anybody's lit watching. And she sneaked out. <laughs> and I'm thinking, now look here. She's four years old at the time. And she's already figured out what's right and wrong. How is that? Because if you're not knowing what's right and wrong, you're not sneaking around, amen? Yeah. If you're doing the sneaky look with the sneaky eye and the sneaky steps, you've already figured out you're doing wrong and it's going to get caught. And as soon as dad says, hey, what you doing? Well, she takes off, closes that door and jumps to bed. Four years old. But the bed... To do what I want to do, how I want to do it, the way I want to do it, when and where and with whom, is already there. Already raised its head and said, do it. That's what you want. By the time she gets to be my age, well, that passed without well warning. We have several, several trained individuals, highly, highly respected professionals in here in the field. We've got, we've got a couple with multiple doctorates. You guys, you ever heard the path, the neural pathways in your head? I know you have. Let me give you just a real quick course on this. A neural pathway is a micro-sized little pathway that your thoughts pursue. The first time you have a thought about something, it is almost imperceptible, even on a microscope, the little path it takes. But did you know that the more times you pursue that same pathway, it begins to become reinforced and gets bigger and wider and broader. And soon, your thoughts are jumping and taking that pathway until it becomes a highway. All right? Why am I telling you? I'm telling you this because our sin bed is so powerful that it immediately takes us from that little path to the super highway and it takes it and reinforces it over and over again until our desire to do what we want to do is now something we don't even think about. It just happens. We're on that path over and over and over again. That's why it takes the transform. Listen to me. It takes the transformative renewing of your mind by the Holy Spirit to change the way you've been thinking to a new way of thinking. Amen. Amen. Are you with us? Amen. Amen. So, two kinds of people. There's the blessed and there's the wicked. We see this happening and we see that there's an immediately the way this breaks this down. First one begins with the word blessed and follows with reasons for that blessing. The blessed are blessed because the blessed person does not walk in step with, stand in the way of, or sit in the company of the wicked. I want you to notice the downward spiral, walking in step with the wicked. Good company ruins a person. You're hanging around, folks who are not making smart choices, God-honoring decisions, and it won't be long before that influence then begins to influence your choices and your decisions, and they won't be God-honoring. Psalm 1 begins with, do not walk in step with these kind of people. Stand in the way of the sinners, or take the way of the sinner. Guys, it's not that you always have to be hanging around the wrong people. It's just that when you are hanging around them long enough that you start taking on some of the way they're thinking, some of the way they're acting, some of the way they're talking, some of the way they're walking, and the next thing you know, you go from walking in step with to standing in company of. That gives you more time to affiliate, to inculcate. Finally, demonstrate what it is they've been doing. But notice the progression.
progression moves further down. From walking in step with, standing in the way of, to sitting in the company of mockers. It moves from a, a casual acquaintance with walking in step with, to stopping and standing in the way that sinners take, to sitting in the company the walking, the standing, and sitting today, we might say that the progression moves from to walk as a lifestyle or a pattern of conduct, to stand, to stand and, and simply be in agreement with, to finally sitting there and dwelling with them and living with them and agreeing with them, to taking on everything that they're doing. You've adopted that lifestyle. The Bible tells us here and elsewhere in the Old Testament, we are not to do as those that are doing what is God, what God's word teaches against. In fact, God warns us repeating that we, God's people, are not to walk in step with the wicked, that is to do what they do. We are not to stand in the way of the sinner, to follow the same path. We're not to sit in the company of the mockers, that is to believe and act as they do, turning against God, his word, and his way. We live in a culture today that is doing just that. You read your word and you look about you and you see this world. It has set its face against God. Be careful here to tell you this. All of that is not to say that we as believers should not reach out to unbelievers and have them as friends or acquaintances. I hope and pray that you do. I hope and pray that you're reaching out to the lost people of the world around you. What I pray is, is that you remain firmly implanted in God's word, firmly entrenched in the path that he has for you to walk in his way and firmly resolute to do his will. Amen? Amen. So that when you're influenced by what somebody might say to you, you're like, I'm oh, not. I can't do that. I will not walk in that way. I will not do what, that, that what you're saying. I'm not going to do that. And it gives you an opportunity for them to ask you, why don't you say this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you go there? Why don't you say or do or act or be? And you can tell them, because that's not who I am. That's who I'm not in Christ Jesus. That's not what he has for me in my life. I'm meant to be like him, not like the world. Doesn't mean that as a result of your friendship with Jesus Christ, your relationship with Him, there are things that you can do and things that you cannot do. Somebody said to me one time, well, Pastor, what if somebody called you in the middle of the night and said, Hey, uh, you know, so and so in your congregation is down there uh, at Billy Bob's bar and uh, he's needing, needing your help. Would that mean that you wouldn't go to the bar? What it would mean is I call my elders up and say, guys, we're on a recovery mission. Mm -hmm. I want you to go with me and we're going to go in there and we're going to get this precious one out. And I'm not going in there by myself. Because even if I'm in there trying to do the right thing in the right way with the right heart or the right spirit, somebody might take that and twist it into something altogether different. But if I go in there with a band of brothers who are in agreement with me and we're showing great love to that one, how are they going to say all that? We must walk and match our walk with our talk. Be aware that it's always easier for someone to pull you down than it is for you to pull someone else up. The Bible says it this way. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Amen? Amen. And the wicked Speaking of the two kinds of people, and speaking from the negative, the Bible implies that the blessed person should not do these things, and thus speaks to what the wicked person does. They walk in step with the wicked. They are attracted to the things of the wicked, that is to do what they do. They stand in the way that sinners take, that is they do the same things in the same way and walk in the same path. They believe and act as the wicked do. They are not just with them, they want to be a part of them. And they want to be a part of that wicked behavior. They've gone from looking on and kind of admiring how those people live to then hanging on to 
those who do it, and then becoming one who does it. Sit in the company of mockers. In fact, joins them in their actions, turning against God, His Word, and His will and His way. Today, we might say that that progression moves from they are attracted to, to coming into with, and joining them, fighting. The wicked person's heart and mind, as I said, are set against God, set against God's word, set against God's way, and set against doing anything but God's will. 1 Samuel 2.9 teaches, He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Job 38.15 adds, The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Psalm 5.4 For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. We see many, many examples of God's word admonishing people to not <coughs> sit, or stand, or walk in the way of the wicked. We see that there are clearly two types of people what different paths are these two people on? Wildly different. You might say, world different. How about us, though? Are we willing to take God's word for what it claims to be? Are we willing to believe that God would reveal himself to mankind in his word and then give us his inerrant, infallible, inspired word to help us live a God on our own? If we really believed that this was God's word and it was profitable for living and helping us to be godly people, then why wouldn't we live day and night in this world? <coughs> because the truth is, while we believe in it, we are also just as quick to turn to self-help books, watch Oprah, or listen to some other guru, on TV, pay TV, who will tell us how we can live our best life now. If that was not true, these guys wouldn't exist, they wouldn't be so profitable, and they wouldn't have written their 14th book on how to have your best life now. Amen? Amen. You already have everything you need to live God on God pleasing. Amen. Two kinds of paths. Verses 2 through 4. But those who delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditated on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that wind that the wind blows away. Verse 2 begins with detailing the path of the blessed person. It includes delighting in the law of God, God's word, the Bible, and meditating on his law day and night. How has this led to the person being blessed of God? Well, in Joshua 1, 8, God tells Joshua, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I was speaking with my son this week, and I remember saying to him, you know, um, I'm sure glad that, that you, know, you, you made it there safely and you got yourself in place, and Mom and I were so glad to be a help to get you moved in and all that kind of stuff. So he says, Dad, I, I'm so grateful for you. Kind of, you, you, you and Mom, is, you're the kind of parents that everybody wishes they had. And I said, well, son, I don't know. We made a lot of mistakes. He said, no, no, Dad, please hear me. Not everybody can pick up the phone and get godly counsel. Not everybody can pick up the phone and talk to their mom and their dad and say, hey, I got this question, or you just help me something, or I wanted to run something by and get, get the kind of encouragement or the kind of godly counsel you can guys get. I said, son, you know, I never had a dad like you have. But I, de I determined really early on I was going to be the dad my kids need me to be 
And so I set up in my life three operating guidelines. The first is this. To be all the men of God that God has created and called me to be. Second, to be the husband my wife deserves. Third, to be the dad my kids need me to be. Anything that comes around me or wants to threaten my being able to keep those things in priority in my life cannot be a part of my life. It doesn't matter what it is or how alluring or attractive it is. It doesn't matter how self-serving that may be. It cannot and will not be a part of my life. So I am blessed to be the dad. Well, I've got a lot of things to answer for. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. But I'm grateful to end that you see me through the, the lens of grace. And I'm so proud of you and so glad to be your dad. And we love you. I gotta tell you. I gotta tell you. One of the hardest things to be on the planet today is a godly person. One of the hardest things to be is a godly spouse. Seeking genuinely God's best for that other. And the second, third hardest thing to be is to be a godly parent. It's hard. And, and it gets harder when they get older. Because then you have to be out of parent mode and more in a counselor advisor mode. And at some point, you've got to wait for them to ask you. Amen? Amen. That means sometimes you've got to stand on your tongue. <laughs> Godly parent. Look here. There are two kinds of paths. The wicked. They don't have that kind of thing. But God is telling us, if you are following my word, I'm going to bless <laughs> your steps. I'm going to make, make it happen for you. It's going to guide you from making mistakes. I just told you a minute ago about Ian. Ian is making steps with godly input and godly counsel. He's a man of God himself, and he's a good Christian man. He's a good husband and a good dad. But even he will come and say, but I need God's word. I need his Holy Spirit, and I need to seek godly counsel from my mom and dad and trusted others who will help me make sound choices. I said it to him this way. Son, I, I didn't have what you had. I went through the stupid force to hit every branch and every stupid tree. <laughs> but now, now you can run the path that I made for you. And you can miss all of them. So I know that. God's word tells us that if we keep his law and his word in our hearts and our minds, meditating on it constantly, we will prosper he will prosper us. The way we do this is by reading his word, studying his word, and obeying his word, making the life changes that God's word demands as a result of his Holy Spirit's leading, and allowing God's word, listen to me now, allowing God's word to not just inform our decision making, but influence our decision making. There are some things that my flesh says that I want to do, but God's word says that's not what you're going to do. I didn't hear you. Because no matter how badly I want something, if I want to do His will and walk in His way and obey His word, that means I got to obey Him, not me. Amen. Amen. And that's how we stay out of trouble. Biblical times, as of today, there are a number of attractions and distractions that call out to us all vying for attention and our investment of time and our energy and our talent and our treasure. A person's remedy to all of this is to simply turn to God and say, I don't see it. I want to see this. I want to do this. I want to be this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk in God's way, obey God's word, and do God's will so that I can be a blessed person spite of what anybody else says or does, and whether or not anybody goes with me, that's the path that I'm going to be on. Amen? Amen. We often hear the word blessed today bannered about some very casually. We see it on, on abbreviated custom 
prestige license plates. How come you never see the prestige license plate blessed on some beat up old sled? Why couldn't you be blessed in it? You know? Try the junker. Because the answer to that is, is we don't believe in that. And I'll tell you right now, I've got some blessed people who even own a car. Amen? Amen. It's first, go back to what God's Word says and use it as the benchmark. Go to white and just and pure and good and recognize that it is all we need. Be that kind of person. God's word goes on and says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not weather. Whatever they do prosper. I've shared this story with you before. I was in my 40s. 44 to be exact when I went to my senior pastor and told him that I was going to pursue a call of ministry in my life. He says, what do you do? And I told him, he says, how much do you make? I told him, he says, what's your education? I told him, he says, you got kids in college? I said, I got two in college, one who's uh, getting out of there in high school. He says, you got a mortgage? I said, I do. He says, you got a bunch of bills? I said, of course I do. And he says, you're going to be starting your third career when everybody else your age is retiring. That's insane. Amen. Oh, <laughs> step out there. And I gotta tell you from 44 to 60 right now, we've been in ministry. We've had good times and some tough times. But I've never seen God be unfaithful in all of that. What he has called us to do, he's been faithful to bring to completion. Amen? Amen. I stand before you today, a 60 year old man. But oh my goodness, I feel just like this. A tree planted by stream of water, yielding fruit over and over and over again in season. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he's doing, ain't it? Amen. Wow. I want to live that kind of life again and again and more. We learn about God's favor and the blessed person. God will continue to bless and show his favor for that person. You see, the blessed person is blessed by supply. Over and over again, God will continue to provide for that one and work in them and to them and through them. And thirdly, we receive a bountiful blessing that will be replenished and refreshed and revitalized. Yeah, there are a lot of guys my age who are retiring and calling it quits. Many of them during the pandemic said, that's it, I'm done. Me? to keep going. I want to see people reach for Christ. I want to see the church grow to the place where we're going to have to do multiple services. I'm asking God to do big things. Because I'm not done. Because I believe He's not done. Amen? Amen. Amen. But not everybody delights in the Word. Not everybody delights in His Word. J.C. Ryle said, we should have this. People never reject the Bible because they cannot understand it. They understand it too well. They understand that it condemns their own behavior. They understand that it witnesses against their own sins and summons them to judgment. Then try to believe it is false and useless because they don't try to believe it. They don't like to believe it because that's true. Many would discount the Bible as antiquated and obsolete, irrelevant for today's enlightenment. Well, I'll tell you what, all you got to do is watch the news or flip on the internet and see just how enlightened people are. Not much, amen? Amen. amen. Not much. The wicked. God's word in this section points out that the wicked are like chaff, the wheat goes away. What do we learn about God's disfavor for the wicked? First of all, the blessing God intends for those that are blessed are withheld from the wicked. Don't think that you're going to get something good from God when you're not honoring God. Amen? Amen. 
Number two, there won't be any supply from God. You might be in, enjoying God's common grace right now, but you won't endure and enjoy much more than that. Thirdly, there will be no bountiful blessings of refreshment, replenishment, and revitalization. In fact, it's going to be likely the opposite. Isolation, frustration, stagnation, and desperation. We see that played out in the news all the time. And lastly, we see that a wicked person's path will be fruitless, ultimately leading to destruction. We see people time and time again thinking that somehow they can enjoy the best in life, the best from God's blessings, and yet reject the giver of those blessings. That's not so. Lastly, two kinds of destinies. Psalmist writes, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Verses 5 and 6 sum it all up for us. If there's any doubt, God has made it abundantly clear. There is no ambiguity, no vagueness, no longer any question of where these paths lead. Wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The destiny of the wicked is clear, both in this life and in the next. God will assemble the blessed to himself in that of righteousness, the assembly of the righteous. He watches over, but the wicked are left out. The scripture reveals that God will not allow the wicked to stand in the judgment. On that day, every knee will bow. The enemies of God have stood against him, his word and his leading. They've shaken their fists at him. They've taken his name in vain. They've mocked him. They will be turned over to their wicked hearts' desires. And on that day, they will have the strength to shake their fists or stand against him. On that day, they will be broken and humbled. The way of the wicked leads to destruction opposite of the blessings enjoyed by the blessed people of God, the righteous. The great theologian Alexander McClare has summarized it this way. It's small, so I'll read it to you. Its theme, the blessedness of keeping the law, is enforced by the juxtaposition of two sharply contrasted pictures, one in bright light, another in deep shadow, and each heightening the other. Increasing closeness and permanence of association are obvious in the progress from walking to standing and from standing to sitting. Increasing boldness in evil is marked by the progress from counsel to way or course of life and thence to scoffing. Evil purposes come out in deeds and deeds are formalized at last in bitter speech. Delight in the law will deliver from delight in the counsel of the wicked. As a negative, so the positive begins with the inward man. The main thing about all men is the direction of their delight. Where do tastes run? What pleases them most? And where are they most at ease? Deeds will follow the current of desires and be right if the hidden man of the heart be right. In effect, he reduces perfection to the same elements as the other psalmist who sang, I delight to do thy will, man. Thy law is within my heart. The secret of blessedness is self renunciation. We would say it this way. Echoing what the Lord himself said, if any man would come after me, let him first deny himself. You can't, you can't find blessedness without being blessed by the blesser who is the Lord. Amen. You can't find blessedness in the Lord without first denying yourself. Amen. Amen. Maybe you just haven't had a fill of your sin yet. Maybe you're thinking that 
well, it's nice to come to church and I do all these things, but you'd rather have a right relationship with your sin than with God, others, and self. Maybe you're a believer here, but you enjoy playing with fire. You both love and hate the sin that you coddle. You want to continue in your sin, but hate the way you feel after you partake in it. It's robbing you of the joy of your salvation. Or perhaps you feel, though you truly want to make a change, you feel overwhelmed with the guilt and shame, sorrow, or fear. That's called conviction. The Holy Spirit of God is bringing conviction for sin. Right now, whichever one of those camps you may find yourself in, you have a choice to make. I say that because it's not free will. It's the choice that we have made, have to make right now as the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to your heart. He's speaking into your spirit. He's speaking into your reality your circumstances and calling you to make a choice. The choice is to turn from your sin and turn back to God in Christ Jesus through the power of His Holy Spirit by forgiveness for sin, the peace of God, the salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Amen. Amen. same choices to make. In these last few moments, I want to challenge you, even though we're few in them, and a great likelihood is this, that most of you have made a profession of faith in Christ Jesus, are born again in this Holy Spirit. Most of you probably read God's Word on a regular basis, strive to do what it teaches, to walk in His way, to do His way. I ask you this. If that's all it was, and we, we believe that we're doing these things, why would the Lord say, why are you calling me Lord and Lord and do not do what I say? Sometimes we cannot do what God's Word teaches by sins of omission, not simply by acts of commission. Amen. I am asking you, each one, when you leave this place today, find a quiet, quiet place with the Lord. Say, Lord, am I doing what your word teaches? Am I doing your will as your spirit does? Am I walking in the path of the glory and glory and honor to go for others? But whatever it is standing between me being the blessed person that you want me to be. But I am right now. Point it out and help me change it. Stand in this way. Worship team is going to come. We have an opportunity. And I pointed this out earlier. Every single day, not just on Sundays, every single day, and sometimes hundreds of times a day, say, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to say what you want me to say. I'm going to be what you want me to be. I'm going to set aside what I want, what I like. What makes me feel good? My rights, my hopes, my dreams, my wants. None of that exists anymore. Because I died with you. Now it's not I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Amen. 
So God help me. Change my life.